In this video, brought to you by Intel Officer Luke, we're going to go through an assortment of tips and tricks for beginners. This is the captain. Brace for impact. So our first tip and trick is the inside turn. So we, we see this one a lot for new players. Basically, it's this mistaken idea that you have to be on the outside of the maneuver tool. So if you're turning left, your tool has to be on the left side, or if you're turning right, your tool has to be on the right side. The actual rule is as long as you don't overlap the maneuver tool where you end up, then you're fine. So this allows you, especially with small base ships, to do what's called an inside turn. So in this above example, we're activating with Demolisher, and if we do an, a regular outside turn at speed three, then we're going to end up in terrible double arc from the Mic-80 and almost certainly die. On the other hand, if we do an inside turn by placing the maneuver tool on the other side, but turning sort of inwards as it were, we end up slightly closer in, and not only do we score a double arc ourselves, but we manage to just avoid double arc of the Mic-80. And, to boot, we've also blocked it per our earlier video. So the inside turn is a really, really powerful navigational tool to keep in your belt, and it's one we see a, new, a lot of new players not think about. So basically, as long as your ship doesn't overlap this tool, then it's a legal move. So the inside turn, keep it in mind. So an exception to overlapping the maneuver tool that we see a lot of new players not being aware of or forgetting that they can do is that when you ram an enemy ship, uh, it doesn't actually matter if the, like the, the joints that aren't ramming overlap. So for example, the movement at speed 3 here is a legal move, we're not overlapping the tool. But because we ram, we back up. And the rule for ramming is you back up ignoring overlap, just as long as you can physically place the model without ramming. Now this can be used in a lot of really advantageous ways. You can use it to set up moves that you wouldn't otherwise be able to legally do because otherwise you would overlap the tool. In this case, it's a really good way for us to get a cheeky double arc. We go to a legal move at speed three, we would ram, so we have to overlap the tool and we end up something like that, which allows us to get a double arc. Another tip to keep in mind as a new player that we see a lot of new players forget is in general a lot of new players forget to use their upgrades in all circumstances. But one of the main ones we see this for is leading shots. So for example this ISD-1 has a leading shot and it's flacking out its front. With leading shots, uh, his first roll was an accuracy on the blue dice and a blank on the black. Now a lot of new players will just forget about their leading shots power and just move on. But you can use this on all attacks. And this is really, really important for AA because it means that if you whiff, you can just spend that blue dice, re-roll, and get the hit you need. This also works for double blue ships on the off chance that you roll a critical and an accuracy or some combination thereof. You can spend one of them to re-roll the other and get, try and get that hit that you need. A similar one we sort of see in this vein of flak is when people move up Demolisher and they don't have a valid ship target, we often see them just not taking any shots. But if you move Demolisher up and you don't have a ship target, but you do have squadrons in range, take the flak. It's a free shot. You might as well use your power. Take that flak shot. And, you know, finally on this point, we see a lot of new players just not flacking. And we cannot stress how important it is to take every flak shot you can, because every little bit adds up. In this above example, often the Rebel player will just shoot out their side arc at the ISD, because that's a big juicy target, and that's their big juicy arc, and then they'll just move. But they also have a bunch of squadrons in their rear arc, and they have a black dice and a blue dice to flak them with, or two blue, depending on the type of ship it is. Basically, what we're trying to tell you is, for the love of God, always flak when you can, and you don't have another valid target to go against anyway. It's a wasted shot if you don't, and we see a lot of new players do it. <laughs> so one of the other big uh, tips we want to give new players, because we see them don't doing it, is in regards to the operation timing of attacks. So what we mean specifically by this is that as a general rule, you want to roll your base dice, add any new dice after that, and then after that you want to re-roll them if you can. 
We see a lot of players doing it in various orders. That's basically, as a rule, the optimal way to do it. Roll your initial dice, add new dice, re-roll them. So as an example of this, we're activating this radar at close range. It does have double arc, and it's got a concentrate fire command. Now, if we're, going, if we're starting with the front arc, we would want to roll its two black dice, two blue dice, and see what we get. So we've done pretty well. We've got a hit crit, a blue hit, another blue hit, and a black hit. It's a pretty good roll, and we've already got five damage, so we probably just want to leave it as is. We don't need to add anything here because we think it's good. We don't need to re-roll anything because we haven't rolled any blanks. Roll your initial dice, then add, then modify. All right, so in this example, we've activated the radar. We're shooting out the front arc. We've got a concentrate fire, and we've rolled two blanks on the black, a hit on the blue, and an accuracy on the blue. So rather than re-rolling these straight away, we're going to concentrate fire first see what we get. In this case it's a hit, but let's just say we'd whiffed. So now we have three blanks, and with Ordnance Experts we're going to reroll all of them, getting a hit, crit, hit, crit, and a hit, which is an obscenely good roll and would, with the accuracy, almost certainly ensure the destruction of the CR-90. It might not seem important, but if we'd done it the other way around, if we'd re-rolled those two blanks first, and you know, even if we'd still gotten what we did, then we concentrate fired, and we rolled that blank, we'd we've effectively cost ourselves a couple of damage potentially, or we have at least lost the opportunity to turn it into something better. So the other reason why it's important to keep in mind that you want to roll your initial dice first, then add dice, and then re-roll them, is because sometimes you don't know exactly which dice would be better. For example, now we're targeting a GR-75 out our front arc, we have two blue and two black, and because it's got a scatter, we really want an accuracy. So in this situation, we've rolled one naturally. So with that in mind, we want to get extra damage. So we want to add a black. But if we hadn't rolled an accuracy, we would have wanted to roll another blue to try and get that accuracy that we need. Now we see a lot of players create their pool of dice before they roll, which means that they can't react to what they've rolled. If they've added a black beforehand, they might not at, at roll that accuracy. Or if they've added a blue, they might not get that damage that they need. By keeping in mind the fact that you can add your dice from a concentrate fire or any other ability that allows you to add dice, after you've rolled your initial dice, then you're always going to increase your chance of doing what you want because you're reacting to the information that's been given. You've got more information which allows you to make a better decision. So another thing to keep in mind generally, but also specifically when you're doing concentrate fires or adding dice from powers like external racks, is to keep in mind the idea of brace brackets. Basically, every time you hit a new odd number, that's when the brace number gets higher. So every time you hit 3, 5, 7, 9, so on. What this means though is, is that if you're already in one brace bracket and it's unlikely to get to a new one, you're better off saving the dice for an, in another attack. So for example, in this shot, front to side, I got two accuracies and two damage. It's not the best roll in the world, so I probably would add my external racks to this because I've already got two damage, so off the new, two new black, I'm likely to get to another brace bracket. For example, I'm at three. Gonna re-roll here, and now I'm at four. I didn't concentrate fire into this because unless I'd rolled, you know, both and hit, I was unlikely to get to five. Pretty simple. Just always keep in mind the rough brace brackets when you're adding dice and you're re-rolling dice. Bit of a more of a niche example, but the other time to keep brace brackets in mind is with, uh, was with objective powers like precision strike. So for example, in this above, above scenario, we're playing Precision Strike, and the Mc80 has rolled its side arc to the front arc of the ISD. I've whiffed on one red dice, I've gotten two crits on, on two of the blues, one damage, another damage, and a double damage for a total of six. A lot of players will leave this as is, not keeping the brace bracket in mind. Five damage braces down to three just the same as six does, so it's better for me to spend one of the dice with the power from Precision Strike, score the points, and potentially score a nasty crit. 
So one of the other tips we also want to give to beginners is about using the range ruler as a rough guess for the maneuver tool because obviously outside of a ship's maneuver you can't pick up the maneuver tool. You can however use the range ruler at any point in the game, in your turn, your opponent's turn, whenever you like. And this can be really important as although it's not perfect, it, it can be used to get a rough idea of how far away you are on the maneuver tool. Uh, and the way to do this is just to sort of have a rough idea of where the speeds line up onto the distance. So speed one is roughly about the same as distance one. It's a little bit longer, but not much. Speed two is about halfway into distance three. So it's about halfway along. Speed three, similarly, is about halfway along into distance four. And speed four is just shy of the full range ruler. Now this can be really helpful at least for straight line distances, for working out how far away you are for your ship's current speed. So for example, if I'm looking at this and wondering do I need to speed up for Demolisher and working out whether I need a navigate command, I can look at this and see, okay, at speed 2, I'm only going to get to about here, which is probably going to be out of range for close distance and therefore not what I want. But knowing that speed three will get me to about here, I can see that I'll most likely end up in close range. And in fact, I can check that by working out where close range is. So by using the rough guidelines of knowing where my speed is on the range ruler, I can really make an educated guess on what I need. And a lot of good players do this. Obviously, it's not perfect because if you turn, it's going to shorten your, your distance traveled, but it's a good rough estimate. You can use it to make educated guesses, and obviously, as you play more, you'll get better and better at guessing these distances. But it's a really, really handy tip to keep in mind. Speed 1, distance 1, speed 2, halfway into distance 3, speed 3, halfway into distance 4, and speed 4 is pretty much the whole ruler. So another tip in mind, uh, in sort of in that vein of rough guessing where your ship's going to end up, a really handy one, especially for overlapping guessing, is that basically your shield dial, which counts for overlapping, will end up in line with where the number ends on the maneuver tool. So if you look, for example, if we bring it into focus, if we put the ship at the end, we can see the shield dial is roughly in line with the end of the three. So this can be really helpful as you can use it to work out, will I ram or not? So if we look, we could see like, okay, here I'm not going to ram because the three's short of the ship's base. Whereas if we go a little further and we can see that the three does overlap, then we know that we would overlap, which could be good, could be bad. But in any case, it tells you more information, which is always helpful. So another helpful tip is to do what we call background marking. Uh, this is really good when you have to make uh, multiple range guesses, uh, both for moving squadrons and for moving ships. But basically, most of the maps you play on are some form of star field or have stars on them or other features like that. You can use the feature to your advantage by basically using it as a point of reference. Background marking. So for example, in this above scenario with my A-wing, I know I can move distance five and that 5 gets me to this point on the map here and it's helpfully marked by a specific star that I'm now focusing on. Using that point of reference I can then check whether I would be in distance 1 or not and perform the attack that I want to do and I can see that I would be. Therefore I can comfortably and safely say okay I'm going to activate this squadron, move up and oh look I'm in distance 1. Background marking. So another really handy tip to use for squadrons is to use obstacles to force obstruction. Basically what this means is when you're on an obstacle, you're permanently obstructed. This is really good as it means you can't be engaged and locked down, and it also reduces the amount of flak you take. In this above example, we've put more Mithil on the obstacle because perhaps we want to move him to a more advantageous point to do his lovely splash damage, and as a result, even though this X-Wing can shoot at him, he's going to have one less dice because he's obstructed, but more importantly, he's not going to lock Mauler down because they're not engaged. Obstruction blocks engagement. 
The added benefit, the two for one, is that because we're obstructed, the GR75 cannot flack us. Using obstacle blocking like this can also be really important for keeping vulnerable but important squadrons alive. So in this example we have a hawk sitting on the obstacle to help reduce the incoming dice from the ties that are, engage that are trying to engage it. It's really good because it keeps your vulnerable ships just alive for that little bit longer. It doesn't always work, but again, it's a nice little tip to keep in the back of your back, back pocket. So that's all the beginner tips and tricks we have for today. We're going to do some more advanced videos later on, but we really hope that these minor tips and tricks allow you to improve your game, if ever so slightly. With that, we wish you all the best of success in your store champs, your regionals, your local tournaments, and just crushing whatever person you're playing with. This is Master of the Fleet Intel Officer Luke, signing off. So we hope that these beginner tips and tricks uh, really help you improve your game somewhat, slightly, and um, you know, six... <laughs> so we hope that the... <laughs> 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 <laughs>